Okay, so it's uh, 5.35, it's the Northampton Board of Health meeting. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this session is public and is being recorded. Uh, present we have uh, Joanne Levin, Meredith O'Leary, Lauren Levy, um, um, Suzanne, uh, why am I blanking on your last name? It's okay, it's Smith, it's all Suzanne right. Smith. <laughs> um, I, and, I Kelly Constantine. Uh, is there anybody else here? Uh, we're no. missing um, Cynthia Swopis, who we uh, I think is having technical She's having difficulties. difficulties. Yeah. Okay. I'm Did she text her? you? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, is there anyone here for public comment session? Nope. Okay, there's no one here for public comment. Okay, uh, we announced that we're recording. Uh, we have minutes to review. And I guess we had previously had a question about what needs to be included in the minutes and how much detail to include. We could still go ahead and, and uh, uh, look at the minutes um, as is, and we haven't, even though we haven't resolved that issue. Did anybody have a question about the minutes? I did find one missing word in the September minutes I told Kelly. I don't know if she sent out the new version. Um, any concerns? Other than the, the question about whether we put um, changes, editing changes in the minutes, um, on the August minutes, Second page under COVID-19 update, one, two, three, four. It's a paragraph that starts, the second paragraph that starts Director O'Leary. I think it stated that she has started, not stating the she has started. Okay. Kelly, you catching this? Um, where on that, Suzanne? The fourth paragraph down under. Fourth paragraph down. Mm. First sentence under COVID update. Okay, I stated that she has started. That, that. She, that she has started, yeah, just, just a small type. <clears throat> Anything else anybody have for the uh, August minutes? I think they're perfect. We try to avoid that word in our household. <laughs> I didn't hear a thing, so it's all right. Oh, welcome. Your technical difficulties Thank are you. over. Have abated. Um, and so we're looking at the uh, August minutes. Yeah. Any other comments? No comments. Anyone like to make a motion? Motion to approve the August minutes with the uh, edit at page two, paragraph four. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, I'll do roll call. Uh, Lauren? Um, what, I forgot what we said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> minutes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? I'll abstain because I didn't hear the discussion. Okay. Or did you look at the minutes? Yes. It was, just, it was just a typo. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and Joanne, I'll say yes. So that's August minutes passed. Okay. Um, then we have the September minutes. I see them with changes, but I guess there's a way to view them without changes. Without markup. Oh, those look much better that way. Any comments um, on the September minutes? Um, in, in reading them, um, I was interested in the paragraph where we talked about the board. It's the bottom, it's the discussion, uh, the bottom of the um, first page. And I looked on the um, MAHB website and there's actually a very nice description of the responsibilities of 
of the board. If I can find it, um, I sent it very late to Kelly. Uh, I apologize for that. <clears throat> but it says um, the board is required to pre perform many important and crucial duties relative to the protection of public health, the control of disease, the promotion of sanitary li living conditions, and the protection of the environment from damage and pollution. And I, I thought that was a nice summary that um, broadened the concept of, of regulations. Now, I know these are the minutes, and that was the discussion that we had. Um, so I'm not sure it's appropriate to add this into the minutes because we didn't discuss this. But I, I wanted to put that forward as a very nice, concise, one sentence description of what we actually are required to do. Thank you for that. Um, I think it does not go in the minutes, but we can. Um, I'm actually curious about where the description um, of the board role came from, Kelly. Was that something that's the um, job description from the city? Yes, I pulled that off the city website. Okay, so um, maybe next time we can, uh, Suzanne, we can bring that forward. And uh, if we like it, we could ask the mayor to uh, update the, um, or, or we could even work on a job description that we think is better. This, this was the description of the board. I'm happy to send the yeah. link. To, um, since it's a public document, I feel comfortable sending it to everyone. Yeah. Okay, can we put that on the agenda for next time? The the, the job, job description, description or the, the description of the board? Well, I, it, would that not go into sort of a job description of sure. a board member? I mean, we might sure. want to update it and make it prettier. Um, that can go in there. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link. Okay. Uh, any other comments about the um, September minutes? My, my only comment is that they're not final until the red line is gone. <laughs> I'll change it. The red line. Oh, I don't see that anymore. I took out the track changes. Um, um, I, I do have a I do have one uh, suggested change in that same sentence in that same paragraph about the description of the board. Um, line four. Um, and and that I may be confused by 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 the red, but and therefore board members do not board related discussions. I think what's missing oh. in there is something like engage in. Oh yeah, I forgot a word in my edit. <laughs> yes, I, I asked Kelly to add the word. Board members do not have board related discussions between meetings. Or engage in, that's fine too. Engage in, yeah. Engage in, okay. Let's change it to engage in. Uh, that's the only thing I saw. Yes, good pick up. Anything else? Does anyone want to make a motion? Uh, move to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Any further discussion? And, uh, Roll call, all in favor, Lauren? Yes, in favor. Suzanne? So me, yes. Cynthia? Yes. Wait a minute, Cynthia. <laughs> Susan answered for Cynthia. Cynthia? Oh, I, I thought she said. Uh, <laughs> I gotcha. I thought she did as well, but it's just Cynthia, yes. Was that a yes? Yes. I can't hear you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, and Joanne, yes. So those minutes have been approved. Thank you all. Um, all right, Meredith, you're on. All right. Uh, I don't have the agenda in front of me. What is it? Just COVID updates? It's uh, updates. It's uh, COVID activities, COVID testing, public health ambassadors, safety of indoor dining, and then shelter updates. Ah, okay. All right. In order. <laughs> Whatever right. order you would like. <laughs> Hot off the press, our um, total case counts as of noon today for Northampton, we're at 282 total cases. Um, in October, we had 22 cases. In November, 
114 cases and December, we're only two weeks into December, we're at 84 cases. So that's a total of 220 cases in the last six weeks that accounts for 37% of all our cases to date, which is pretty alarming. The rise in the number of cases is so steep. And especially when I break it down even further for the uh, starting 13, day, 13 days after Thanksgiving, it's just incredible the acceleration of cases and increased hospitalizations we've had. Since Thanksgiving, 20 days now, Thanksgiving, out of those 220 cases, 107 of them are from the day after Thanksgiving. Wow. So that's just about 50%, which is totally alarming. I hope people really look at these trends and we don't have a repeat for Christmas. We can't maintain it like um, so out of the 582 cases, 207 of them have come out of residential living, uh, long-term healthcare facilities. And out of that 207, only 24 of them were in the last six weeks. So of those 220 cases, only 24 cases were out of long-term healthcare facilities. That's just about 5% of our cases. Where in the first surge, at least 60% of our cases were out of long-term healthcare facilities. Now, mind you, we also have increased capacity in testing. There are other variables that feed into that, but I just wanted to, to show you that, give you some context, what we're looking at. Our positivity rate in Northampton, and this was just released about a half an hour ago from DP8, is 1.89%. Uh, and Joanne and I were talking about that um, the other day. It's extremely watered down because it includes higher education testing. Do you, would you like me to uh, show you my screen as the what we see at Cooley? Yeah, that'd be it's lovely. Very, very different. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Will you let me share my screen? Do I have to allow that? Yes. I've never had so much power before. When you said 282 cases, these are the cases since March, right? 282. 220 cases since October 1st. I but think, uh, yeah, she said 282, but she meant 582 total to date. 582 total, yep. Did I say oh. 282? I'm sorry, 582. So yep. that the 220 is a little less than half of your total caseload since March. Yep, yep. Because you gave a percentage, which was a 77%. What was that? 37. 37. Oh, 37%. That's Last what I, okay. Mm -hmm. So 37%, about a third of your cases is from the last six weeks alone. Okay. Yeah. Or the last two and a half months, you said October. I, I don't think I have to allow you to share your screen. I think you can just do it. No, it says the host won't allow me. You can have, make me a co-host. Okay, do that? there we go. Uh, You're a co-host. So is it clear ah. when you say 220 case, it's since me. October. So it's mm -hmm. it's 10 weeks. Okay. Yep. Uh, is, is it 10 weeks? Okay. Here's my um, Cooley graph. So what we do is look at all the testing that we do, uh, like through the drive-through and through inpatients. This is our... <laughs> Our rate of rise in October, we had a nice, you know, less than 1% positivity rate and we're up to like 7% and it just keeps going up. It's wow. terribly alarming. Um, I guess there's concern about the state statistics for Northampton getting diluted by Smith College that has, you know, testing a thousand people repeatedly twice a week and diluting our, our local numbers. But this is what is reflected in actually our patient population. I mean, this is not only in Northampton, this is our catchment area. I mean, we get people from Springfield and Holyoke a little bit, but I think it probably is a better reflection of what's happening in Hampshire County. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, very alarming. We've been advocating uh, since September, since the kiddos came back, uh, came back to college, September, October, wherever that was, and they started testing to separate the two with higher education, without higher education. And they did it on the state level, but they haven't done it on the local level. So we're still advocating that they do that. Like right now, the state positivity rate with higher education is right around 6%. Without higher education, it's a little over 8%. 
So it makes a big difference. It's very, very telling. And for Northampton in particular, a small community, if they're testing several thousand a week at Smith, that's going to make a big difference in our rates. Because I think a rate of one point, what did you say, 1.2 or something is like ridiculous. It's just not. 1.89. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just not reflecting what's really happening, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. And Lauren, I'm sorry to go back. Yes, uh, in the last 10 weeks, we've had 220 cases out of our total 582 cases. Got it. Okay, if I didn't make that clear, sorry about that. No, 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 that, 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 I, that I totally get it now. <laughs> so our, eight, our average daily incident rate in Northampton for the last 14 days per 100,000 is about 19. Now in the 19 state, per thousand. Pardon me? You said 19, 19. per thousand. Yep, per 100,000. 100,000. We can't hear you too well, Cynthia. I have an unstable connection there, Tony. Can you hear me now? A little better. Okay. Um, on Smith, they're not in session, right? Correct. So what's all the testing going on over there? They've had 120 students there that never left since last, since they shut down. And they test their mm -hmm. faculty and staff too, and everyone else on campus. Do you know how many tests that is uh, a week? I think they're doing the students twice a week and the faculty once a week. So I'm not sure how many it equates to. I just wonder why they're doing the faculty if there's no school. There still could be faculty on campus. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess is that they're on campus because they're local. Just curious. Mm -hmm. Probably the safest place to be is Smith campus. <laughs> Yeah. So when you say 19 per 1,000, about 100,000, mm -hmm. that's a daily rate, correct? That's the 14 day average 14. rate. Mm -hmm. 14 day average rate. Mm -hmm. Average daily. Average oh. daily rate. Average daily. That makes sense because mm -hmm. the population is about 30,000, right? So that means that means six cases a day, roughly. Yeah, I can actually, t I have my average daily here, I think. Yep, yeah, so 5.57. Got it. Mm -hmm. And how are you doing with your um, nursing staff and contact tracers? Do you feel like you have enough staff? Yeah, we just hired um, three more contact tracers and onboarded them this week. So we have my two full-time nurses who I'll have come to a meeting next month and introduce you to them, um, Kate Kelly, and we have um, Vivian Franklin. There are two full-time. And then we have three contractors that do contact tracing that are all onboarded and ready to roll, which is fantastic. And we still have Jenny. Her official last day is the 22nd, but she said that she'd be willing to stay on, um, you know, minimal hours, three to five hours a week to help out if we needed it. So I'm not going to quite cut the ties quite yet, which is great. Um, so right now, it's, I can feel you know, the weight off the shoulders a little bit, um, which is fantastic. Um, so it's working out really, really well. Hopefully um, we can maintain it. If not, we've got a few people in the queue that I can hire on. So you gave, uh, just to give a little background, you gave a presentation to uh, city council and mm -hmm. they gave you some money to do this, yes? Um, they, they appropriated money for my mm -hmm. department how, mm -hmm. and used it to see the way, you know, how mm -hmm. I see fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yep, they're very generous. And they're very appreciative of your presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it then, in the, thanks, Cynthia. Um, so in the state, we're currently at 297,301 cases. Um, that's just for, pulled from today's data. Um, we're also going to be in the yellow again this week, if you guys are watching that color coding um, per the state uh, reports, weekly reports. For fatalities, they're at 11,558 total. About 61% of them accounts for fatalities in long-term healthcare facilities. And I've been watching this number pretty closely because two months ago, that number was 67% of fatalities were from long-term healthcare facilities. Every week I see that getting smaller, which means just more people in the community. 
are dying right now, which is extremely sad. And on average for the past seven days, we're seeing about 44 deaths in Massachusetts. Um, the seven day average positivity rate for the state, like I said, is about 6% with higher education, 8% without higher education. And we're seeing on average about 5,300 cases um, each day. The other thing that we're watching really closely right now is hospital capacity. And to kind of give you where we were at um, right around Thanksgiving. So for capacity, what we had available in terms of occupancy um, right around Thanksgiving was 34% availability of inpatient beds and 56% availability of ICU beds. Last week, that went down to 23% availability of inpatient beds, and this is including surge, and then 35% uh, percent capacity of ICU beds. This week, it's down to 15% inpatient beds and 30% ICU. What that equates to is about 1,672 inpatient beds and 435 ICU. That's in the state. In Massachusetts, of course, we're having the same trend. Thanksgiving, we were at 44% for inpatient beds. We went to last week down to 18%. This Wait, week the first, I'm sorry, the first set of numbers were the state numbers? Yep, the states. And, and the second set of numbers are now local? Our region, huh? Western Mass. Uh, Western Mass, yep. okay. So we were at 44% availability inpatient on Thanksgiving. 18% last week down to 15% this week. That equates to about 174 available beds in Western Mass. And then for ICU, we were at 67% availability at Thanksgiving, <coughs> down to 50% last week, down to 43% this week, which equates to about 67 ICU beds. So those numbers are alarming, especially <coughs> with Christmas right around the corner and all the other holidays. I think the only good news I see in these stats and what I see at the hospital is that there are fewer patients in the ICU, sort of the most patients are on the medical med surge floors um, and you know not as many or percentage wise in the ICU. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. You wanna talk about Cooley specifically, Joanne? Do you have anything to add? Um, I don't have those those kinds of numbers. I can tell you that in the spring, our peak surge, the most number of patients we had in house was 20. We didn't quite reach that yet this year. I think our highest was something like 18 um, and it's down to something like 12. Um, <clears throat> what's really different this time is, you know, in the spring, basically the hospitals had to stop doing all elective cases, surgeries, we basically shut down our OR, had the anesthesiologist helping out in the ICU for intubations and sort of all hands on deck in the ICU. We never really went over our normal capacity in the ICU, although we were prepared to do that. Um, but the ICU was really the place where people ended up. Um, what we're seeing now is um, not quite the same, uh, almost the same number of, of inpatients, um, but percentage-wise, fewer of them in the ICU. And I think that probably is multifactorial. My guess is that partly we have younger people getting the disease now, that not all just, you know, primarily the patients from the nursing homes. Um, and so maybe they're not as sick, but we also have know how to manage these patients a little bit better. We're using dexamethasone, which is a proven to decrease mortality and um, morbidity. Um, so I think that is having an effect. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Um, but we, the hospital is busy because we've not canceled elective surgery. We're trying to maintain normal business and take care of COVID patients. And that is stressing our system, you know, a little bit. Um, so I think we have on a day by day basis, we're deciding if we're canceling some elective surgery, if we feel like we need the beds and that's done, um, that happened a few times, I think earlier in the week. Um, but that's not uh, standard right now. I mean, it really, it uh, was very hard on hospitals in the spring to actually stop, uh, you know, all elective procedures because we had no income and we also had an empty hospital except for COVID patients and we really could have maintained more 
uh, business. And we also could have provided healthcare. I mean, what happened in the spring is that people stopped showing up for healthcare. And we know that there were excess deaths because people probably died at home, heart attacks and belly pain and all kinds of other things. And so we're trying to maintain a balance between providing health care and making sure we have the capacity to care for the COVID patients. Um, for a hospital to be profitable, what percentage of bed capacity do you have to keep? I'm, I'm just out of curiosity, or is that uh, some number that you don't know about? <laughs> I don't know those metrics, but I know you know they keep an eye on on capacity and what they've budgeted for a certain capacity, um, but I don't know what those numbers are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was at a Cooley Dick meeting last night, and I asked that question about surgeries, and and Tony told me that you were reducing thirty percent. Is that? Um, I think the state has said to reduce 30% if you need the beds. Um, okay. And, and Thank I you. yeah, I think, it, I think it's up to us, you know, when we feel like, you know, we're at that capacity where we need the beds. Um, and where we're needing beds really are in the med surge floors and less so in the ICU. Um, so I think they did hold off on some elective um, joint um, surgeries this joint, week. Yeah. Yeah, that's the most elective kind of surgery do. I mean, yeah. if someone has appendicitis, they need that surgery, you know. Um, yeah, so there is some of that going on, but I think that's on an as needed uh, basis. Thanks. No problem. So bringing this back to yep. uh, Northampton specific, if we're done with the hospitals, just to let you know that we do have um, some clusters happening in our long-term healthcare facilities again, which we're monitoring very closely. Um, in Christopher Heights right now, we have 15 confirmed residents, um, uh, four of which are in the hospital. Some staff are positive too. Um, Cooley Dickinson has been awesome in helping them do um, weekly testing. They've got the um, Epi COVID team supporting them. Um, Highview, we have a small cluster in there. Linda Manor, we have a small cluster in there. And then River Valley, we've been dealing with um, for the past five weeks, and I'm happy to report it's the first time that we did testing that they've gotten no positives, which is fantastic. Um, we've had a little activity um, in our workplace, um, and I've been monitoring that. We've had a little activity in our schools, but we've never had any in-school transmission, which is fantastic. Um, because every single Friday I am on a committee and an advisory committee um, where we have to kind of um, let the superintendent know what we're feeling in terms of either keeping the schools open or pausing. Um, and I've really been a huge advocate for keeping the schools open as long as there's no in-school transmission. Um, what and schools I wrote, are open now? I thought they're, they're mostly remote. No, we started going into hybrid. We, we had high need kids in the schools starting the end of September. And then on the 30th of November, we officially started our hybrid phase in. Um, and we're two phases into our hybrid right now. So um, it's been going really, really well. Like the schools are doing an amazing job. The teachers, the students, the families. I mean, it's really been, um, it's been pretty awesome. Um, I wrote a letter to a statement to the school committee for last Thursday school committee meeting that I'd be happy to share with you. The mayor um, actually read it because I wasn't able to attend the meeting. Just um, again, telling them because everyone is looking for specific metrics in order for us to make this decision on whether or not we're going to pause or stay open. And I keep on reiterating the fact there isn't any set metric. We have to look what's happening all around us in the schools and all around us. And I would hate to say, well, once we reach 5% positivity, we're going to close down because that might not have any impact on the school community. So anyways, I'd be happy to share that statement with you. Um, what else is going on? Oh, we um, stood up our own testing site, which is new. Um, so the first day that we did testing was a week ago on the 11th, Friday the 11th. We um, were at Smith Boak and we allowed uh, Smith Boak staff and faculty to come in because they've been um, hybrid since September. 
So they've got a lot of kiddos and a lot of staff in there. Um, we invited inspectional service departments in Northampton to come in and get tested, police departments and DPW. So we did 125 tests and this was just asymptomatic testing. And out of those, we had two positives, which was great. So we were able to do contact tracing immediately and get those out of the workplace that needed to be out. Um, Tuesday, we stood it up again and we went to all the schools, six schools and the police department and we offered it to the staff and faculty at the schools and we did 215 tests and we had zero positive results, which I was really pleased about. And then on Friday, we are going back to Smith Volk just to do the faculty and staff again for a half an hour and then we're heading over to the senior center. And there I've opened it up to um, uh, three Northampton Housing Authority properties, Cahill, McDonald, and Salvo House. I've offered it to any of those who have, um, who are unsheltered, have unstable housing. Um, and I've offered it to the municipal workers. So I'm expecting to do about 350 tests on Friday, which is always fun because the results come back like mid Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> which I was not expecting last Saturday. <laughs> um, so Meredith, when did the senior center open? That was closed for so long. It's not open. I'm just okay. using the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. And then I'll test a couple more times. And again, this is just strategic. I'm not opening it up to anyone in Northampton. And if we have people when we're doing our, our, um, case investigation or contact tracing that are having difficulties getting tested, we send them to our test site too. And we're using County EMS as our vendor to do the testing who are amazing to work with. They are just so flexible and easygoing and professional. I, I, I hope to use them perhaps in the future with vaccination projects that we're gonna do, not sure. And they're using the Broad Institute to do the analysis, which is awesome. So results are coming back anywhere from 12 to 18 hours, which is really quick. How do you get them back? What elect electronically? What's or I go into the, the Broad portal. I see. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's all I know. I have a secret code and I type it in and voila, there's my results. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Meredith, when you say you're doing it strategically and then you mentioned River Valley, is that, does that mean when you hear or see of a positive result at an employer or in a restaurant or something, then you strategically go in or what, how does that? I could offer it to their employees to come to our site. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And, and yep. that's, that would be your normal procedure, yep. right? Yep. If you, okay. Yep. This testing site is new, so it wasn't the procedure before, but now that you're going to have this through early January? December, no, December 30th. Mm -hmm. We're using CARES Act money, and that has to be spent by the 30th, which is really unfortunate. But I'm hoping that there'll be another pot of money down the road that we'll be able to use to help support testing to get us through the second surge. Um, they did open up, UMass was given some money and they will be doing testing through, um, I think mid January. January, they're doing asymptomatic testing there. You can't, be a you can't be a close contact and you have to be over 10 years old and you can only go once a week, but uh, it's pretty easy peasy to register and go there for testing too, um, which is great. I think they're gonna continue after the students come back, but more limited hours for the public. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. I was on a five college consortium call yesterday and they intend on having, I think around 9,000 students coming back um, the second week of, third week of January, which I'm just shocked at and. Just uh, uh, as an aside to that, we've heard, are you, if you're referring to UMass. Yep. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, that's what they want but the way enrollments are going, the students are not, um, they're not enrolling at the level they thought they would. Oh, really? Yeah, and so, but I don't know what that final number is gonna be because they're really, really pushing to get more students in. Yeah, I think that's happening at a lot of colleges. Students are not having the kind of experience they want, so they're just taking a little leave and coming back yeah. when this is over. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the town of Amherst is, very happy about that. 
<laughs> New meaning for the gap year. COVID I mean, year. I'm being facetious that they're so happy they're going to have so many students coming back, but. Right. Right. They publicly didn't support it in the fall, so I'm sure they're going to do that again. Right. The town of Amherst. Right. Um, public health ambassadors. So that too is coming to an end because they were supported financially through the CARES Act. Um, my public, uh, what do we call him? My COVID compliance officer will be staying with us. That's going to, he's going to be on the budget through until we don't need them anymore, but um, that was approved. If we do need public health ambassadors, I'm sure all I have to do is ask. A lot of their work was outdoors anyway, so it's, you know, with the winter here, it would be project oriented if we need them. Like they've been fantastic going to the test sites, to the flu clinics, they've really been instrumental. If there was any type of small event that was happening in the city or um, on the park and rec fields. They always had a present there, handing out masks, handing out information. Great group of kids. Um, so I'm hoping to keep one or two of them on and uh, working with us throughout. But yeah, unfortunately that's coming to an end. Meredith, sure. what is your compliance officer finding? Uh, are there people who are, or businesses that are misbehaving? Yeah, so I don't want to say it's misbehaving. I feel like they just become complacent in what they're doing and, you know, over time get lax and lax and lax and then they need a little, you know, a little push under the tush and they get right back under there. Um, so there are certain businesses, no matter what we've done, they barely are meeting the standards. Um, so we actually, I talked with our COVID compliance officer last week, we're actually going to start issuing um, violation orders with fines. We're to a point, like we're 10 months into this now, if you're not doing what you're meant to be doing, we're going to hit you with a fine. We're done. I mean, look at where we're at. We can't take any, any, any more leniencies on anyone. Mm -hmm. And what are the fines? Do you remember? Uh, it depends what it is. Some of them are 300, some of them are $500 per day per violation. So yeah, that's how we're moving forward. And we do a lot of proactive inspections. I mean, that's what my team is doing primarily like 80% of their job. They're out there, they're in the field doing things proactively. Awesome. And what type of violation are you talking about? Um, a lot of them are still mask violations. We'll go in there. Employees aren't wearing their masks. Hard to believe. It is hard to believe. Yep. Yep. Um, it could be um, seating in restaurants are too close. Kel, help me think some of the violations that we've been. I've been pretty removed from this part of it lately. Um, the grocery store is not keeping track of the amount of people that are going in there, not maintaining their uh, social distancing. We've had a couple of calls recently regarding um, medical practices having too many uh, patients in there and um, not wearing masks. In medical practices, wow. Uh, those are some oh, of the, the patients not wearing masks taken uh, recently. Yeah, I have to say there are places where we struggle with crowding, you know, where places that are walk-ins that are not by appointment. Uh, we do um, we do struggle with this, like our um, ER waiting room, urgent cares, phlebotomy, where people don't have appointments, they just walk in and they say, can you go wait in your car? Um, and people will say no. You know, it's just, it's difficult. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. And so most of these are complaint driven, the violations that we're looking at. Not necessarily. And just to clarify, can an employer tell a customer to wear a mask? Yes. And, or, and if you don't, customer, you have to leave the premises? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. 
And you, as a customer, tell the business to wear their mask. <laughs> <laughs> right? That'd be fantastic. Susan, you unmute. Oh, sorry. I thought I just unmuted it. Um, what are the consequences if the customer refuses? Ask them to leave. And? I, I mean, we, there are those who simply refuse and refuse to leave too. So are the police called at that point? I don't know if that's ever happened in Northampton. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that would have to be the case. It wouldn't be us running down. It certainly happens other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, Meredith, there you go. That's how, how wonderful you've been working. We don't have any of those episodes <laughs> that occur in Northampton. I mean, seriously. <laughs> That's a big deal. <laughs> That's funny. Mm -hmm. Other big things, the shelter opened up, um, I believe it was December 7th. Was that a Friday? Possibly. Um, so that's good news. The bad news is the service net doesn't have enough staff to support it at its capacity, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, Pre-storm, they only had 16 people in there, which was just a lateral move from the cot shelter, if you ask me, because the cot shelter housed 15 people. And our overflow shelter at First Churches has the capacity to house full-time 32 people with like five to seven more as an overflow if it was a really cold night to get some more people off um, the streets. But so right now they're at 20. Um, we're hoping to get to 32. And they're being tested um, once a week and on admission? No, they haven't. So they were getting tested um, prior to coming in. But when I talked to them on, what is today's Thursday? When I talked to them yesterday, you know, asking why they don't have enough staff at this point, like they should have been planning for this for months now to, you know, to um, support the overflow. The, it's not even their overflow shelter because it's the cot shelter moved over. So it's one shelter, it's nothing in addition to. Um, I clearly told them how disappointed I was and that we're gonna have people dying, freezing to death out in the streets. And I said, what is holding it up? And they're like, because I had heard from someone and the mayor called me yesterday morning saying it was testing. I said, mayor, it's not testing. Um, so anyways, long story short, I said, you need to get out there, get as many people in the shelter today. We have a storm coming tomorrow. I'll test them on Friday, cohort them. We can do this safely, you know, we'll test them Friday and then they can stay there indefinitely. Um, they were only, they were only, uh, able to get three people in. I don't know. I, it's their shelter and I've really been kind of given direct orders from the mayor, you know, to let go a bit. It's their shelter. They're running it. Whereas in the, you know, in March and April and May, it was the Northampton's shelter. It was city property. We were running the shelter. ServiceNet was providing the support staff where now it's just, this is ServiceNet's business and, and Meredith, let it, let it be. <laughs> So I'm still supporting them where, you know, we have volunteers um, facilitating any of their needs that they have. Um, I'm connected with them at least two or three times a week. But in short of lighting a fire under their butt, there's nothing I can do. You know, I actually was on the phone with uh, the regional director yesterday and I said, I have 80 people who volunteered last weekend to help with the shelter. Um, we just got them all quarried this week. Can they, in the mean, you know, in the midterm while you're hiring and onboarding staff, can they come and provide support with having one service net staffer there so we can fill these beds? I, I just don't know what to do at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So that's, it, it's very disheartening. but that's the biz on the shelter. Um, the testing is not a, a rate limiting step, right? They can be tested, Dr. Bossy or someone. Dr. Bossy, yeah. Since tests over. 
they can come to my test sites. Yeah, I mean, we can go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure. But they're open. All right, and um, I, I thought we would just talk a little bit about uh, indoor dining and where you think the state is going with that and what's happening locally with that. I don't think the state is going to do anything more restrictive than it is right now. What's the current uh, rule now? Um, indoor dining, indoor dining. So they went back down, they rolled back to phase three, step one. So six people at a table. The only thing that changed is you have to wear your mask now unless you're eating. Before you could, you had to wear your mask until you sat at your table. But even at your table, you have to wear your mask unless you're eating or drinking. And you can only stay there for 90 minutes. Those two things are new. Um, it's not a capacity. It's just uh, separating tables by six feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So I don't think they're going to do anything. Um, you know, we don't have really good data um, at the state level or locally that supports making it stricter. And only a week ago did our MAVEN questionnaire start including um, specifics about um, restaurants and dining and exposures there. So it's just, we're gonna just start capturing that now if we can. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult to make, you know, um, a regulation or a requirement that doesn't have the data to support it and that has huge financial impacts. Um, we're watching it closely. I have all of my nurses asking those questions. Um, I would love to see is indoor dining closed, but I don't think we're in a position to do that. What I think we could do perhaps, because this has kind of been a problem that I've seen, the state requires that you keep a register of the parties coming. And basically what people do, you know, managers at the restaurants do or the host, they take one person's name of a party and a phone number and that's it. So when we do have to do contact tracing, we have one name, one number, and sometimes people really are um, hesitant about giving out other people's names. So I think what we're going to think about doing is making a requirement for the businesses, for the restaurants to take names, phone numbers, and addresses of every patron that comes in, assign a table number to it, um, time in, time out, and also assign a wait staff to it. So we know exactly what's going on. It'll give us um, you know, much more ease when we have to do contact tracing if that were to happen. So that's something we can look at. Um, that, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm, no, go ahead. No, it seems that there's already, I mean, if you look at re credit card receipts, usually there's the name of whoever paid and at least and the name of the state and of the, the waiting staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Plus, if you pay cash, mm -hmm. but it seems that it doesn't take much more than, than a credit think card receipt. People are really reluctant to share names. They feel yeah. like they're ratting on people to share the names of their friends who were with them and you know, report right. them to public health. I think that's the issue. Mm -hmm. You know, when the message is, you know, just dine with your household members and then you've got a table of six and three different couples, but yeah, it's exactly it. They just, they don't release that information very willingly, if at all. But at the same time, I, I mean, I, I don't know because it's been so long. If three couples go out for dinner, very often they'll split the tabs. So in some way, in some way they may have all the information that they need through credit cards, unless people pay cash, I guess. They Venmo each other. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. It's challenging. I'll, I'll just I'll put it that way. Mm hmm. Well, I'll just say that the federal government, the MMWR, I think it was last week, put out what they consider standard public health recommendations on risk factors, and indoor dining was considered a risk factor. Um, you know, when they looked, this is a look back at March and April. But. 
I'm I'm not I'm I'm totally not comfortable doing it. <laughs> this point oh so, yeah i haven't done it so that was based off data from february uh, from march and april joanne i think it did i send that to you you did but it was old it was, data. yeah it was old data but you know the risk factors um you know yeah no it wasn't recent data but mm -hmm. it was a look back So there was on the agenda, I see open gyms. Um, how do gyms operate at the moment? They're at 40% capacity. Mm -hmm. um, equipment has to be. <laughs> I don't know what that was. It's weird. Um, they're at 40% capacity. Uh, equipment has to be either six or 14 feet apart, depending on what the equipment is. Masks now have to be worn all the time, but masks had to be worn before um, per Northampton's order. Um, I think the last time I read in one of DPH's reports, there were 17 clusters associated with um, gyms. I don't know how many cases that equates to. So it's up there. It's probably at the same risk level in terms of how much we have per cases and clusters as dining. But I think there's a lot unknown about gyms. What about places of worship? Yeah, those are a problem. Yeah. Oh, they are a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are clusters there. Yep. Because of distance issue or people don't wear masks? It's, it would seem that you would, you could attend without any issue if you're not taking your mask off and you stay away from people. Some of the largest clusters are associated with places of worship, lots huh. and lots of cases. Mm -hmm. I think their occupancy rule is something like 40%, which is a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that's new. That's only, that 40% is only of the last couple of weeks. Singing what was it before? Practice. Well, I think I it's been 40% for a long time. Is it now 25%? Okay. I don't know. Hmm. But then, then they're singing, and I think there is an issue with distance when you have that many people in a room. Oh. Yeah. But I don't think we know all the details of those clusters, just that they exist. Yeah. Yeah. They're super spreaders. That's what they call them. This is surprise. I mean, I suppose it would depend on the church, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. A lot of our churches are just virtual still. Hmm. And you know, a lot of our restaurants are just doing takeout model again. They've closed their indoor dining. We've had some restaurants um, and businesses contact us and said they're gonna close until mid-February sometime. Packards is one, Northampton, Hotel Northampton is one. There was, I think there was quite a few, maybe up to a half a dozen. I should make more. Yep. Uh, Meredith, have you gotten word from, from restaurants that they're closing, that uh, they are not going to renew their permit? Kelly might know that better than I would. That's so. Um... The French place just closed. Yes, I saw that this morning. Bistro La Gras. What is, what is closing? Bistro La Gras. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've only had like, uh, Goberry is renewing, but they're closing for the winter and they'll open up like May, he said. Um, I'm still working on permits, so I'm still not quite sure who has not uh, I hope to have a better idea this coming week as to who hasn't submitted their permits yet. Thanks. Yeah, come January's meeting, we'll, Kelly will be able to tell you who didn't renew and because she'll reach out to them probably and say what's up. And that's when we might find out that they're not opening back up. I 
And Meredith, did you give a report on the initiative that you sent an email out for staying at home? If I missed that. Oh, I can show you. At home for the holidays. Yes, let's look. You guys ready? It's, it's still kind of in draft, but I can. And can you I tell can... us where it's going to go? And uh... I don't know yet. Oh, OK. <laughs> It's a work in progress. So there hoping... was one there was one of your office that you released on the Northampton Facebook page. Yes, yes. That was fun. I was hoping for national exposure. So <laughs> <laughs> well that on Facebook got like twenty five hundred hits. The most we've ever gotten in the past was like twenty. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ready? We wish warm holiday greetings to all and encourage you to make it a quiet holiday season. I know that it is strange and sad not to gather for winter holidays. And of course, Zoom parties just aren't the same. But the virus spreads rapidly during indoor celebrations. And many people do not know that they have the coronavirus when they are spreading it. COVID is not a gift anyone wants to give or to receive. Let's all be here and healthy for the holidays next year in 2021. Of health to your loved ones. Stay home, stay healthy. Neat. Great. Can you put the, the link on the chat? I did. Oh, you did? Nice. I'll save the other one. <laughs> stay at home for the holidays. Sweet. That's great. Very sweet. Were you guys, did you see the Christmas tree was made out of gallon jugs of sanitizer? Then the menorah was the pumps, and then the bonsai <laughs> candles were um, little um, keychain sanitizers. We were all inclusive. <laughs> Great. That was just so much fun my department needed. I can't even yeah. tell you how many laughs we had. It was fun doing it. Thank you all for participating. Our pleasure. So where can we find these? Or these aren't finalized yet? We're, we're fine. Uh, we'll finalize them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I get you guys back? Uh, stop sharing. Stop sharing. Oh, I see it. Ha. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> All right. Uh, Do you see them in the chat? No. No. Oh. What? No. Oh, now it's there. Jo Joanne, can I run a question by you? Sure. Um, um, and if Meredith, you know anything, or Suzanne as well, or, and Lauren, um, I've been hearing about blood types and COVID. You have a certain blood type. I hear it's O. Your likelihood of getting COVID is diminished. Any? I've heard that rumor for a long time. Um, last time I looked it up, which was months ago, there was no data. I, I don't know if that's changed. I heard that um, eight months ago. OK. Um, yeah, same with me. I heard rumors about people with type A blood having a higher risk of right. disease. Um, and I don't I haven't seen anything recently about it. I haven't seen any any new data or any big studies. I don't really know. There's also, you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there. There's vitamin D deficiency and right. I mean, there are some people doing all kinds of wacko 
things with zinc and vitamin D and pepsid and yeah. all kinds of stuff out there. Um, I think the, the one thing that, ha um, at least in the hospital, that has made the biggest um, impact is the dexamethasone, a dramatic decrease in mortality. Um, but we're actually, I don't know if you're allowed to join. Um, Suzanne, I don't know if you're still on the medical staff at the hospital. We're having a talk on Friday morning on treatment of outpatients. Okay. Just resigned today. Oh, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I, I don't need privileges anymore for my malpractice insurance. So right. I, I just wrote the letter today. Wow. Oh, well. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> it was just an annual check for, for my purposes. I, yeah, that's right. all it meant for me. Yeah. I was going to say, Joanne, the things you were talking about, they were on the internet, so they must be true. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Meredith, you had one more thing that you wanted to talk about is the plan for next year. Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, at, at our last meeting, which was I don't know, two months ago, we had um, who came in from CES and Spiffy and was talking about social justice and social equity. And I just wanted to bring that up. We wanted to start thinking about that, incorporating it into our work. And I think the first thing that we were thinking about is, you know, um, looking at our job description and how we can write it to make it more inclusive. I just, I don't want this to get dropped. So I just was, wanted your opinion, what we should do moving forward. You're talking about job description for a board member? For a board member, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, I think we could start with the one that Kelly found from the city and a statement that Suzanne found, and we could put it on the agenda for mm -hmm. next time if we think um, mm -hmm. we, we do want another board member. We do, but we, you know, I think our hopes is to have uh, another board member who serves a population who's underserved. Um, and how do we, you know, how do we advertise that? How do we write it? I mean, mm -hmm. I think Sarah Bankert said that she Sarah would be Bankert. willing. She would be willing to um, help us with that. Okay. Uh, and and re, and help us think that through and mm -hmm. uh, maybe review some materials. Um, I, I I think she said that even though their program is just getting underway, mm -hmm. um, as I recall, I think it was actually in the minutes that she said that mm -hmm. she would. Um, she yep. was willing to help us. So okay. I, I would love to be able to enlist her her services if she's offering since that's where she's focusing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of thinking about what else we want to work on. I know it's hard with, you know, COVID still here. Maybe this is something we can talk about in February when we're on the flip side of this. When we all have our vaccine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that won't be February, but yeah, exactly. I saw this evening uh, this evening that the Moderna vaccine was approved. Was it? Yeah. Yay. So maybe we can put that on the agenda for January and maybe have her join us and we can actually do a sort of a working discussion of what we want that job description to look like. Mm -hmm. I guess it's ultimately up to the mayor. I, I think she at this point was um, offering to review any things that we had put together. Um, I, I don't know if she was offering to be involved with us from the ground up. I, I may have mis I may be misremembering mis what she said, but oh, we can ask her and see sure. what she's available to do. Um, the other thing, um, when we made our statement um, um, about being more inclusive. Our statement said that we were going to review, I believe, our um, regulations. Um, is that something you think we should be looking at, the regulations that we have already written and, and see if there's something that needs changing? Just to sort of review it and make sure it's you know, we've got the tobacco regs, we've got, um, right? I don't know what criteria we would use. Um, 
well, we won't know until we look at it and see if something doesn't look right. But I think that was one of the things we had uh, said that we were we were going to do. I think we said um, for future ones as well, um, as we write regulations and, and, and the past regulations. If I could, um, just to address that, um, you know, I'm on this police commission mm. and um, when you think you are woke or progressive or liberal, um, you spend some time with these folks <laughs> and um, some of the things that, um, you know, that have just gone over my head um, are looked at very differently from other individuals and from other individuals' perspectives and lenses. And I know I'm not saying anything new. It's just that um, for us to review our policies for this kind of thing, even though I would sometimes kind of consider myself marginalized, I, I just couldn't believe how much some of my um, way of moving in the world has been just shaken by being on this commission. Mm. And um, this commission I think is dealing with health and uh, maybe not as directly as we do, but um, I think what we're doing there is really considering health and safety in our community. So. I guess my comment would be is, is if we're gonna do something of this nature, we may not have the right eyes <laughs> to take a look at um, our, our former policies and regulations. So That's a great point. Um, I, I don't know who does, but I'll tell you, there's some folks in our community that I'm serving with on this commission. I didn't even know they existed. Mm. And they're amazing, amazing people. And I think by the color of my hair, I'm one of the oldest ones on the, on the committee, so I'm learning a lot. So, so anyway, I just offer that. Is there a way to have um, our regulations reviewed <laughs> for some sort of feedback? Because it's true that I'm going to see it through the lens of who I am, mm -hmm. which is the law-abiding, middle-aged white man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's vehicles in the city. There's a human rights commission. Um, there are individuals. Um, I, I don't know who would do it for free. You know, I, I, I'm just not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, the, uh, well, I'm on this committee at UMass and we're doing this for our organization as well. So there's tons of people at UMass that can just look at stuff, you know, and just tell you if your, your language is, is appropriate, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't thought it through in terms of, of city, but um, I'm sure someone on city council can help us with that. I, I guess what would be important is a type of a, maybe a, having kind of a, a, a scorecard or 10 criteria against which you compare the reg saying, you know, having a sense for what, what, what type what type of things to look for um, that may be uh, indication evidence that it's not inclusive and um, it almost we almost needs someone to tell us what what type of criteria we could have in looking through these because I'm, I'm happy to spend a little bit of time but certainly I'm going to have that bias Mm -hmm. uh, but if at least I know what to look for, um, I'd, I'd be better prepared. Um, is, is that something that Sarah, a speaker from last last time, would 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 know? Do she we might. need to talk to someone else? Essentially, <laughs> you know, the how to tell a reg, a reg is unfair or, or, or it have some sort of inherent bias. I mean, I, if I can must, just, go ahead. just give you a quick example. We were, go, we're going through the police department um, uh, policies and procedures on the website. And one of the things I said, and as I was saying it, I realized it was so white, was that, wow, it doesn't seem like they have a strategic plan. And so that, terminology 
and that approach, strategic planning, um, for some individuals would say and did, that's a pretty white thing, <laughs> you know. Strategic. And so I, I didn't even, you know. So it is just interesting. You just never know. You don't know. <laughs> so I don't know what that criteria or scorecard or lens would be like, um, but maybe Sarah could help us with that. It was uh, something that stuck with me a few months back as we were discussing the proposed regulation for the um, uh, for vaping, where in the same room we ended up having representative for the business owners uh, owners and also um, residents that that saw that as I mean we had various very different groups essentially speaking against those regs and what I remember is also one of the uh, two uh, person that commonly sh would show up to our meeting before COVID from the shoestring and right. one of them saying and I forgot his, what he, who, I forgot his name and that, that makes the two but there was inherent discrimination in that rag. And that stuck with me because it, I, I could see where it was coming from when he said that. And, you know, at what point do you, produce, do you protect public health? And at what, what you, where do you draw the line between pu protecting public health and essentially um, um, affecting business owners that are primarily from, from minorities, the, yeah. the, 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 the convenient, which is the point that he was making. And, and yes, in some way, it, 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 was, it, was something, it was saying something that was right, that we were gonna affect them. Um, and we're primarily affecting a, a minority group in doing so. The tension between public health and individual rights is the history of public health. Yes, <laughs> that's yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, let's just rewind back to the mask discussion from earlier. Mm -hmm. It's um, immunizations, um, smoking regulations. It's that is what public health is, and it's some place you have to you have to decide where your cut point is going to be, and that's and never that's never an easy dis uh, decision. And, and also where, you know, because we're policymakers, and I think this is where Meredith, you do this so brilliantly. There's one thing to be an advocate. And then when you have got to put that into policy, that's, that's where your advocacy, you know, you've got to step it back. And I'm not, I think, you know what I'm saying here. It's that um, making that leap and enforcement and all those other things that go with policy, um, is is our role and that's where like you said Sudan it's, uh, it's the history of public the decisions will always be criticized that compromise is that uh, you know and some people do it much better than others <laughs> so yeah. so how do you want to move forward with this i mean we could ask uh, meredith can you ask sarah bankard how she whether she wants to come to our next meeting or give some input some other way um, and whether she has thoughts about who we might consult with if we're gonna review our previous policies and regulations. Uh, okay, if, if you guys wanna provide me with the draft um, job description, I'll send it to her beforehand so she can look at it, see if she would review it and make comments on it. Or do you want to do that at the January meeting, do the draft and then submit it to her? Um, well, we could do that ahead of the meeting. That would be good. Okay. That way she comes prepared as opposed yeah. to give her the draft. Mm -hmm. Is when you say the draft, I know you, there was something that was included that we got today, right? That's the statement that the city puts out about the job description of a board of health member that uh, Kelly found. Got it. That's just standard, standard issue. So before we send it, do, do we send this or should we add some edits? 
to this. Yeah, I thought you were talking about some edits out of the MHB, Suzanne. Right. Language. Right. I'm looking for the link right now to send out to everybody. You want to maybe add add that sentence, take a look at it, and um, I mean, I think it's pretty hard to have a discussion over email, um, and we can't do that anyway. So. Um, um, there, there may be, I only looked at that. It's a document. I looked at it very quickly. Um, there may be other things in there that would be of value. So two of you could uh, use a Google form and work on it together. And we wouldn't be breaking OML. I can put it in a Google doc. And if we had two volunteers that wanted to work on it. Does nobody hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear oh. you. I'm, 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 <laughs> like, am I a mute? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to work on it. If you need a volunteer, there's one. And as well, I just missed what the it is because my internet connection went in and out. <laughs> oh, I'll take the current job description. We'll add Suzanne's language from a MHB. And I'll put it in a Google Doc and uh, Laurent and Cynthia, if you guys want to work on it together, that'd be great. Good. But Cynthia is frozen, so She's we don't frozen. know. What... Right. What else do we want to nominate her for while she's frozen? <laughs> Cynthia volunteered to be the winter ambassador. She'll be working outside. <laughs> Cynthia, are you back? Sort of. <laughs> You're muted. Who are you going to nominate me for things that I just pressed? <laughs> uh, so, did you volunteer to work on that with Lauren? I did. Okay. Awesome. And it's going to be generated by. We, we're hearing about half your sentences. I just Sorry. sent the link. You send a link? I sent the link to the MAHB. Oh, got it. Document. So our next meeting is on the 21st of January. Um, so we, we uh, our two volunteers would put together a job description and maybe we would uh, send it ahead to Sarah Bankert and then maybe have her come to a meeting and we could all discuss fleshing that out. Okay. And going back, how many regulations are they total? Hmm. I know it's a binder, right? <laughs> we have body art, tobacco, we have two tobacco ones, ETS and smoke free workplace. We have a septic regulation. Fog. Fog, yep. Didn't we have to do something special for that? Remember euphoria? <laughs> oh, float tank. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that operating under COVID? It is. Mm -hmm. And didn't we do a special addition to the food code? We did. Yep. So are we talking about 20? No. No. No more than 10. Yeah. Probably less. There's some old ones on the books. I'm sure we could dig up. Mm hmm. <laughs> It was so funny because when I started in Northampton, which is, geez, well over nine years ago now, which is crazy. Wow. I know. Um, I called up DEP because they're supposed to be the repository for all local regulations. So once you pass a, a board passes the regulation, the city clerk certifies it and you have to send the certified copy to DEP. So I called them up and asked them if they could uh, give me a copy of or a list of all of the Northampton regulations. 
And they're like, do you really think we keep that on file? I don't know why people send them to us. I'm like, what? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yeah. We do have a lot of drafts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, team. Does anybody have anything else um, they have for discussion? Yeah. Thank you again, Meredith. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's really remarkable. Um, Got it. I worry about your health every day. I'm I'm in good health. You're in good health. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joanne, did we did you guys read the um, op ed that Joanne did? Yes, yes. excellent. Very that nice. Excellent. I would love it if someone else wrote another one next week. On what? Um, let's think about that for a second. Wait, wait, wait. When was the op ed? Saturday, last Saturday. Saturday. It was such a great analogy. It wasn't an original idea, I have to say. I read it somewhere and then I can't remember where I found it. It was like, okay, I'll just make it my own. You don't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I'll take it. In Saturday's uh, Gazette? Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I must have read it really fast. I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably going to be having a regular conversation with a reporter from the Gazette. Because um, I actually spoke with the <clears throat> editor and I told her that I really thought that the cover of the Gazette looked like life was normal and there was no alarm. Um, and so two things. One is that, that they may be, you know, uh, I may be talking with them on a more regular basis about what's happening. But also I suggested that they have some graphics on their front page. And Ooh. Meredith, they may re reach out to you to try to, they're trying to figure out what graphics they should be having because why everything I look at, you know, has got these arrows and these lines going up so steeply. And I don't think the public sees that. And, you know, a graph is like a, you know, worth a thousand words or whatever. Um, it, it, people aren't seeing that. And, and uh, she thought she was gonna get a, a reporter to start, to start working on having some graphic data. That's a great idea, Joanne. That's, just like, that's what attracts eyes to USA Today is their graphics. Mm. Yep. So we'll see what they what they come up with. They didn't have anyone who was particularly swift at graphics, and you know the graphics that are available to us are are minimal. You know the state uh, public health report that comes out once a week. It's all like numbers. There's no graphs. You'd have to like take each city in New Hampshire County, put them together and watch it over time and make a graph or, you know, it's like it's complicated. Yeah. Something for the budget, Meredith. I'm sure that there are 20,000 people in this area under the age of 18 who could do that in an hour. <laughs> There's also some epidemiologists at UMass who are, you know, tracking things in their own ways. And I, I suggested that they talk to them as well. They may be able to provide some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, all right, I've got to go. Uh, do we have anything else before we go? Everyone have a lovely, safe holiday season, please. At home. I, I <laughs> count on seeing you all in January. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks, Meredith. I I Thank you. All right. It's, wait, uh, wait, don't we need to close the session? I moved. Six oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Check it. Any uh, any discussion? All in favor? Do we have to do we have to do a roll? Uh, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. All right. See you all. Have a happy holiday. Bye.